App switcher. Al close activate def Alexandria home back button. Alexandria show stats. But chapter one. The light of Alexandria image. Two hundred forty five e c e. There is a light on the horizon that outshines the stars and moon, peaking above the dark waters of the Mediterranean. It is the lighthouse of Alexandria, a bright beacon on a dark night. You remember its construction when you were young. As tall as forty houses. They said, shaking their heads in disbelief at the hubris of Ptolemy II. But now, it shines in the distance on this night, guiding your vessel closer with every swish of the roller doors. The lighthouse is proof that anything is possible in Alexandria. Why did you decide to go to Alexandria? I have always wanted to know everything, radio button. I can provide the education that will make the prince. I miss my old friend, Archimedes. We built some amazing things together. Radio button. Uh, I plan to manipulate the royal family until they are dead and I rule Alexandria. Radio. I miss my old friend, Archimedes. I miss my old... I Next. Button. Next. Your new jobs are also exciting, no question. By the request of Ptolemy III himself, you will be both a librarian at the Great Library and a tutor to young Ptolemy IV. But foolishly or not, you are moving because you were lonely in Cyrene, and your excitement to work in the library in Ptolemy's court are secondary to your happiness at once again being in the presence of genius. As you look out on the ocean, a gaunt, bearded man wearing a fine purple cheetah comes to join you at the ship's prow. He gives you a tight, disdainful smile. You are the one who will be young Ptolemy's tutor, correct? You nod. That's me. And you are? So serious, he says with a scoff, as if you should have known better. He looks you up and down. Aren't you a little young to be the prince's tutor? I don't believe my age is relevant. You turn your gaze again to the lighthouse in the distance, hoping this annoying man might get the hint and leave. Hermph, Sisyphus says, and he looks out to sea. But you are young for someone with such an illustrious post. Ptolemy III was tutored by head librarian Apollonius, and even then he was much older than you are now. I'm not certain why you're telling me this, you say. You should simply understand that you cannot expect much advancement yet, Sisyphus says. So when someone like myself, a man of no particular advantages or talents, is offered a position of power ahead of you, remember that I have at least been working a long time for it. If I become the prince's caretaker, do not attempt to deny me the influence that is my due. You should simply understand that you cannot expect much. And what will you do with that influence? Radio button. Checked. One of five. I will stay out of your way. Radio button. Unchecked. Two of five. The, the prince can be our joint creation. What? It is I who will win power. Next. Button. Excellent. So Cebius looks behind him, then whispers, the queen comes. Remember, she thinks highly of me, so you would do well to treat me with respect. Greetings, both of you. Queen Berenice II joins you at the ship's prow. Despite her regal title, Berenice prefers to dress like an athlete, her tunic doesn't even cover her knees. Such a cheaton would have been scandalous in Cyrene, but you've heard women dress and act more like men in Alexandria. Ber As your queen back in Cyrene, Berenice had gained a somewhat fearsome reputation, including a rumor that she killed her previous husband, Demetrius the Fair. But now the people of Alexandria talk only about their queen's legendary romance with Ptolemy III. You hear that in Alexandria, they love instead of fear her. The twenty odd oarsmen are from Cyrene, however, and they carefully avert their gaze from the queen to avoid drawing her attention. I see you two are getting to know each other, Berenice says lightly. My companion has remarkable wit, I can tell already, Sisybia says, bowing low to you in a way you're sure he would not have done minutes ago. But, I lack a name for this fine sage. Erato's thens. Male, radio button, checked. What? Sophia. Female, radio. I'm a man by a different name, radio button. I'm a woman by a different name, R next, button. I'm a woman by a different name. I'm, I'm a man by a different, I'm a man by a different, Sophia. Female. Sophia, check. I'm, I'm a, next, button. Sophist, since I taught many would-be politicians back home. Pythia, because they always come. Athena, beta, because I, well, I do. Is that what you like to be called? Berenice asks with a polite smile. Well, I do have a nickname, you say. My friends call me. Beta, because I am always second best at everything. Athena, because my inventions help defend Athens. Radio button. Uh, Pythia, because they always come to me for it. Athena, because my invention. Pythia, sophist, since I taught many would-be politicians back home. Eris, since I enjoy causing a bit of clever chaos now, by my real name, though, because my unflattering nickname had to do with how I've dissected cadavers. Radio button. Unchecked. Six of six. Checked. Next. Button. How ghastly, Sisybia says, hand to his mouth. Show stat. How, Berenice, however, seems unfazed. You did what with cadavers, now? She says lightly, as if discussing carpentry. Just examining the interior bits in an effort to figure out how the body works, you say. I was very much influenced by the advice of my friend Archimedes, who suggested that the body may well operate on the same principles as... Berenice looks surprised. Archimedes, the inventor? You know him? We were students at the museum at the same time. You nod in the direction of the lighthouse. In between classes, we would run off together to watch the lighthouse being built. Berenice follows your gaze to the lighthouse and smiles at some private memory. And what do you think of my husband's lighthouse? A granary for the Egyptians might have been a better plan. Radio button. I'm eager to perform some measurements from the top. Like Alexandria itself, it's a beacon of hope in a dark world. Radio button. Unchecked. Check. Next. Button. So Cedius rolls his eyes. Berenice smiles. I think so too, she says. The lighthouse doesn't just guide ships. It guides people, beckoning the best and the brightest. It says, here, we work wonders. Your conversation with Berenice is interrupted by a terrified yell from the rear of the vessel. Two Egyptians, one man and one woman, have crawled over the side and boarded the vessel next to the helmsman. 
You look around for the pirate ship, but you only see a trireme darkly lurking on the horizon behind the boat. They must have used a smaller dinghy, low to the water, to make the approach undetected. Pirates, Berenice says, drawing her dagger. Stay back, Sophia and Sosibius. Gladly, Sosibius says, and he flees below decks. The two pirates draw their curved swords, and the woman makes an aggressive gesture toward the helmsman. The old Greek sailor gets the point and backs away from the giant steering oar. We're just here for your cargo, the woman says. Stay right where you are. We'll be gone soon enough. The oarsmen look uneasily at each other, and give a kind of collective shrug. I happen to have installed some anti-pirate traps on this ship, radio button, checked. One of, with my rhetoric skills, I convinced the oarsmen to stand up to the pirates, radio button. Uh, Berenice can fight them, I will stand ready if she is injured, radio button. Un next, button. Berenice can fight them, Berenice, next, button. Berenice runs down the center of the ship toward the pirates. The Egyptians ready themselves for her charge, but at the last moment, she stops and throws her dagger at the hand of the woman, who drops her kopesh sword in surprise. As the other pirate takes a swing at Berenice, the queen ducks under his weapon to pick up the woman's dropped blade. Still close to the ground, Berenice slashes both Egyptians' legs with her new sword. Hamstrung and bent over, they are momentarily stunned, long enough for Berenice to push the pirates overboard. Impressive, you say faintly. Are you hurt at all? No, but I was glad to have you here, Berenice said. I've heard of your skill and healing, and I think I was bolder because of it. The other oarsmen, still more impressed, let go of their oars to prostrate themselves before her. All hail Queen Berenice, one shouts. All hail Queen Berenice, the others say. Berenice smiles to herself as she picks up her dagger to put it back in her belt. You may have taken care of the initial boarding party, but the pirate ship is drawing ever nearer to your ship. Archers gather at the rails of the enemy trireme, drawing their bells and waiting for the vessel to close in. You notice the pirate crew is a mix of men and women, Egyptians and Greeks. At the back of the trireme, an Egyptian woman wearing a large gold leaf headdress appears to be in command. Her flowing white robe and long on top spear mimic. That's Nefertari, Berenice says. The so-called pirate queen Nefertari. A hero to downtrodden Egyptians. Won't they just shoot us if we try to get close? You say. Nefertari has been known to recognize the black flag of Parley, Berenice says. And I don't think she would anger my husband by killing me. Or you. At worst, we'd be ransomed. She seems remarkably unfazed by this unnerving possibility. You consider for a moment whether you're good enough at rhetoric to convince the pirates to work for Alexandria. This doesn't seem like the time. Let's have some weapons I invented instead. Radio button. Yes, let's raise the black flag of Parley. Radio button. Un let's race past them. Our men may get hurt, but I can help them with their injuries later. Radio button. Un Next, button. Next. You remove the arrow from the sailor's arm and bandage the man as best you can. As you knowing that the pirates are, you know a little, show stats, but you know a little of everything, and that includes sailing. You take the steering oar. Knowing that the pirate's large vessel will have difficulty turning about, you angle toward the pirate ship, then urge your rowers to row with all their might. The wind is on your side for this maneuver, so you order the sailors to unfurl your small ship's sail. As you've hoped, the large vessel has difficulty turning to catch you. At your close, you remove the arrow from the sailor's arm and bandage the man as best you can, using scraps of his own cheaton. Berenice watches approvingly. You do know a little of everything. Next, button. The next morning, your ship docks at Alexandria. The harbor behind the lighthouse is busy with ships. Alexandria is a trade center for the whole Mediterranean. Shipman, on the wharf, and on her guard awaits you and Berenice to escort you both to the palace. Their copper helmets and shields reflect the bright sun overhead, leaving an afterimage if you look too long. You were surprised Berenice had no such guard on your vessel, but perhaps Ptolemy's reach extends only so far. I shall see you both around the palace, Sisibius says. Farewell. What do you say to Berenice when Sisibius departs? I try to explain that Sisibius plans to manipulate the unborn prince, radio button, check. I indirectly imply that she should be on her guard against Sisibius, radio button. I say nothing about Sisibius, but chat about our mutual hometown of Cyrene instead, radio button, next, button. I say nothing about Sisibius, I say nothing, next, button. You change the subject to your mutual hometown of Cyrene, where Berenice grew up a princess. Though you intended to try to find common ground with Berenice, you find that your experiences of Cyrene were very different, you were poor. Does it bother you that Cyrene Ike is no longer independent? I am excited to be a part of the Alexandrian Empire now. Radio button, checked, one of three. I admit, I do not yet think of myself as Alexandrian. Radio button. Uh, I admit, I don't particularly care when cities change hands. Ra Next, button. Good, Berenice says with a satisfied nod. Right answer. You, Berenice, and the honor guard proceed toward the palace down a broad avenue line by great colonnades and bustling with people, Greeks, Egyptians, Nubians, and even some Persians, Gauls, and Chinese. You find the mathematical precision of the streets perfect right angles appealing. Every other city you know is a chaotic tangle of streets. The vendors on the street sell a huge variety of goods. One vendor sells olives, dates, spices, local fruits and vegetables, bread, and salt. A butcher sells beef, goat, mutton, chicken, and even crocodile and ostrich, or so he claims. An Egyptian vendor sells a huge variety of perfumes and oils. An art dealer sells painted urns and pots, panel paintings, and painted marble sculpture. Goldsmiths, blacksmiths, and tinsmiths have their own row of stalls, noisy with hammering. Fashions for sale include traditional Greek chitons and himishia, shorter tunics more fit for Egypt, Roman togas, which are like chitons but simply draped instead of fastened, how crude, and even saris and other garb from eastern lands. Anything you may desire can be had for a price in Alexandria. Your eye is drawn to the exotic first, but as you take in more of the city, you see that it is not so dissimilar to your hometown of Cyrene. 
Like Cyrene, Alexandria is a Greek city, and the faces in the windows of the houses you pass are Greek, dark and often curly hair, olive skin, and dressed mostly in conservative, long chitons, despite the heat of summer. But there are hints that these Greeks have become a little different from their peers in Athens. There are more women on the streets, suggesting their greater freedom. Both men and women wear chitons that are draped over just one shoulder instead of two, possibly because of that heat, though the women still preserve their modesty through the careful use of pins. The cuts for both genders are above the knee, which would be scandalous on a woman back home. The women wear more makeup than the women back in Cyrene. Many of the Greek women you pass have dark rings of coal around their eyes. You are also somewhat surprised to see Greeks entering the Egyptian temple of Isis. You had heard that Egyptian mysticism was popular with some Greeks, but you had not yet seen it firsthand. You also see Egyptians on the street bearing palanquins and running messages. Though not so dark as the Nubians, their skin is dark enough that there could be no mistaking them for Greek. Some wear Greek chitons in Hemisia, but many continue to wear their traditional garb, a simple linen wrap about the waist for men, and a dress with straps for women. The Egyptian women wear heavy makeup, and the men often shave their heads. You have heard that most of the Egyptians live in a slum in the western part of the city, where the old Egyptian village of Rakhalis once stood. You wonder how they feel about their conquest by Alexander now, whether the added prosperity can make up for their subjugation. Probably not. Next, button. Tensions with the Egyptians aside, Alexandria has always struck you as remarkable and full of promise. It is hard to believe that such a huge metropolis was founded less than a hundred years ago. Had Alexander the Great envisioned just how popular the city would become, as his workers drew the outlines of its wide and straight boulevards and flower along the ground? When birds came to eat the flower, Alexander's soothsayer claimed it was a sign that Alexandria would feed the world, whether prophecy or astute analysis, this is certainly coming to pass. But had the soothsayer or Alexander ever foreseen that the city would become Alexander's final resting place, or that his death would come at such an early age? And did Alexander's clever general Ptolemy know how valuable the city was when he decided to hole up in Alexandria and let the rest of Alexander's former generals fight over the rest of the empire? What do you think? Berenice asks as the honor guard leads you to the palace. Oh, I've been here before, you say. When I studied at the museum. But I have always loved Alexandria. Berenice grins at your answer. All right. Why? This is the one place in the world where people of all nations seem to get along. Radio button, check. This is the center of all knowledge in the world. This is the beginning of a great empire. R next, button, this is the beginning of a great empire. This is, this is, this is the center of, this is the one place in the, this is the one place in the world where people of all nations seem to get along. Berenice grins at your answer. This is the one place in the world. This, this, ne next, button. Next. Next, button. Berenice stops for a moment, forcing the honor guard to stop as well. Listen, this is important, she tells you. Once my son is born, your opinions will no longer be idle chatter. He must learn from you how to be a good ruler. Whether you favor the elites or the populace, whether you are an idealist or a pragmatist, he may come to mirror the opinions of his tutor. So choose wisely. They st Berenice stops for a moment, forcing the honor guard to stop as well. Listen, this is important, she tells you. Once my son is born, your opinions will no longer be idle chatter. He must learn from you how to be a good ruler. Whether you favor the elites or the populace, whether you are an idealist or a pragmatist, he may come to mirror the opinions of his tutor. So choose wisely. I will. Radio button, checked, one of three. Check, I should hope I will teach him to think independently enough, if he hangs on my every word, I will be pleasantly surprised. Radio button, I should hope I will teach him to think independently enough to have a mind of his own. Radio button, unchecked, two of three. I will, I should hope I will teach him to think, I will, Berenice, they seem to get along. Berenice stops for a moment, forcing the honor guard to stop as well. Listen, this is important, she tells you. Once my son is born, your opinions will no longer be idle chatter. He must learn from you how to be a good ruler. Whether you favor the elites or the populace, whether you are an idealist or a pragmatist, he may come to mirror the opinions of his tutor. I will, I, if, next, next, button. Berenice nods. Good. You continue with Berenice and your guard to the palace, a giant marble building with columns in the Greek style supporting a portico with an elaborate frieze. Coming closer, you see that the frieze depicts some kind of elaborate story involving both Egyptian and Greek gods founding the city. It seems early to create such myths, with the city less than a hundred years old, but so be it. You walk through a large courtyard, between pools stocked with exotic fish. What do you think of this palace? When wealth creates beauty and knowledge, I approve. Radio button, check. The wealth that built this place should have been used to feed the poor. Honestly, I'm thinking about math and have trouble paying attention to my surround. Next, button. Honest, the, when, what, what, you continue with Berenice and your, what do you think of this palace? When wealth creates beauty and knowledge, I approve. Radio button, check. The, on, next, button. You have no problem with a society that creates wonders. Show stats, button. You have, you enter the palace through giant copper doors three times the height of a human being, a marvel of engineering. Inside, you find Ptolemy the Third seated on his golden throne, an empty golden throne aside him. Ptolemy is a lean, strong-looking king, and he wears a golden laurel wreath and an indigo chiton, remarkably simple for such a powerful man. The thrones are flanked by two impassive royal guards bearing spears and shields. When he sees Berenice, Ptolemy the Third breaks into a wide mile and gets up from his throne. Berenice, he opens his arms, and Berenice runs to him. They embrace, and he whirls her around as if she were no weight at all. Thank you for coming, Sophia, Ptolemy the Third says as the two monarchs take their seats. My guards will see that your possessions reach the right place. You mentioned in your letter that I could name anything and you would do it if I agreed to be your unborn son's tutor, you say. Yes, Ptolemy says. What is it you wish? I accept on the condition that you provide a stipend for Archimedes to come visit. 
Radio button, checked. I accept on the condition that you make it very clear to your son that my word is law. Radio button, I accept on the condition that I get plenty of time and resources for my own studies. Radio button, I accept on the condition that you change the laws that treat Egyptians unequally. Radio button, unchecked, four of, next, button, I accept, next, button, Archimedes, Ptolemy says, the inventor from Syracuse. We have been friends for a long time, and I hope to see more of him. Very well, it will be done, Ptolemy says, the guards will show you to your quarters. Welcome to Alexandria. Chapter 2, The Price of Progress, button. Chapter 2, The Price of Progress, Chapter 2, The Price of Progress, Show Stats, button, Alexandria, Show Stats, but Chapter 2, The Price of Progress, Chapter 2, a few days later, an old woman who goes by the name Euclid, Glorious, shows you around the great library. The main hall reminds you of a temple, albeit one with three-story tall bookshelves. In the center of the room, columns made of red marble, an Egyptian novelty, stretch to the ceiling. Between these columns rest long tables where scholars sit reading scrolls and taking notes. The library must have a dedicated cleaning staff, you notice the black marble floor is so highly polished that you can see your own face in it. The ladders that allow access to the high levels of books look a bit daunting, you hope you won't have to climb any yourself. Here we come to my favorite section, Mathematics, Euclid says, Jet Elements. You're the famous may overstate the case, Euclid says, doesn't King Ptolemy also consult you for advice? You say, Euclid shrugs. Episkyros. Team. Ah, there you are, Euclid, says Sisidius, surprising the two of you. I need to have a word with you. The gaunt man is dressed in a cheat hunt eye and rich indigo, the Serapium is the public branch of the library, Euclid says coldly. I am simply a man who naturally commands respect, Sisidius says, leaning on a bookshelf in a way that crumbles the scrolls. I find that particularly in this outfit, I can go where I please. I speak the truth to Ptolemy, as I did to his father, and his father before him, you- Oh, quite the contrary, Sisibius says. I am a man of means, favored by the- You look around to see whether any other librarians are within earshot, but these mathematical scrolls are in an isolated alcove of the library. The three of you are alone. I tell Sisibius to leave, and I encourage Euclid to tell Ptolemy about these threats. Radio button, checked, one of three. I try to placate Sisibius, then I encourage Euclid to avoid needlessly provoking him. I tell Sisibius that I, at least, am interested in his favors. Radio button, next, button. Remember earlier how we told you that the first chapter is available for free? To find, buy it now. If you've already purchased, click here to, if you, restore, restore purchases, link. Entertainment folder, 40, screen recording in progress, button.